Mark development. Uh, before I introduce Mark, who will introduce our speakers tonight, I want to go ahead and thank everybody for attending this meeting and our last five tech talks that we've had. I want you to go ahead and make sure and enjoy yourselves with some of the drinks and treats that we have. We do have t-shirts for sale and we do have uh, comment cards. So please, uh, if you have any questions uh, that you want to provide for tonight's uh, speech, go ahead and write those out. Just hold them up. We have some of our uh, staff people that will be um, picking those up. Uh, if you have any questions uh, after, afterwards, we're going to be standing around and just take a look at anyone that has one of these t-shirts that says the Kenny Corridor Project on it. They'll be there to assist or provide information uh, upon your request. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and have Mark from SEH, our other project manager, uh, talk about tonight's speakers. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. I, again, I want to thank everybody for coming. As I looked out and I talked to a few of you tonight, there's some folks who've been at, at all of these meetings, and, and really that's been the, the whole point of what we've been doing here for the last uh, nine months, uh, looking back now. The idea about continuing the conversation and to, to learn a little bit more about what we're doing in the corridor and what the important issues are. So as, as Buddy mentioned, tonight we're going to talk about recreation, tourism, and economics. And we've got three speakers, uh, kind of a three-part uh, presentation this evening. After that, we're going to do a little Q&A. So we're going to invite the three speakers to, to sit up here. And, and as Buddy mentioned, there's cards in everybody's seats and, and a pen. So hope you saw those before you sat down. If you've got a question, what we're going to do, and we did this at the last Tech Talk, so if you were there, uh, we felt that was a little bit more effective. People had a chance to write uh, their question on a card. We'll go through as many of those as we have time for tonight, but we'll answer all of them. And so there's a, there's a uh, Q&A document that we created after the last Tech Talk uh, that if it's not already on the project website, will be posted up there. That way we can get to all of the questions. So we're going to do some live. The ones that we don't get to, um, we'll cover that way. So that's kind of how, how we're going to talk about uh, the, the layout of this evening. I'd like to introduce our first speaker tonight, uh, Ed Freer, and some of you may remember Ed spoke at our very first Tech Talk. Ed is an is a urban waterfront design and community-based uh, planning professional with SEH. He's got more than 44 years of experience. Ed's going to start us out tonight talking a little bit about uh, outdoor recreation and the, the linkages there to, to tourism and economics, and a very important way to kind of get us kicked off. Uh, and with that, I'm going to bring up Ed. So. I, I can use this. Thank you. Everybody can hear me? So I'm, uh, I'm going to approach this in more of a general perspective. I'm going to be followed by Patrick, who will have much more of a specific, deeper presentation that deals with a specific project. I'm a bit of a storyteller. I'm not a marketing expert. I'm not a numbers cruncher. So if you're looking for the silver bullet, sorry, you're going to be disappointed tonight. So the, really, the big benefit of economics, uh, the economic benefit of recreation and tourism is really this summary list here. The big benefit is your community, the quality of life, the brand that you create, the attractiveness for investment, the reduction of risk and, and uh, wanting to invest in you, which of course results in employment and tax base, I've already overheard some people saying, well, where's the money coming from? That's where it comes from, tax base, investment. The more you ask for handouts, you're going to be disappointed. You've got to generate a base. You have to generate capital. It provides community infrastructure. <clears throat> when you have people coming, they need roads, they need sidewalks, they need trails. They need plumbing, they need sanitary. So the more business and the more volume of people you have, that creates infrastructure. You know, they're not here all the time. So the rest of that infrastructure, or the level of that infrastructure, is something that you enjoy, especially in terms of community services. I've worked in small communities that don't have a grocery store. 30 minutes away, a population of 258 has a grocery store that's open 12 months. That's because of the tourism. It's not because of the 258 taxpayers. Promotes and supports environmental stewardship, the quality of the environment, the sustainability of the environment. And then what makes places desirable? 
we, we used to worry about how much money we make. What's the, uh, what's the salary? Not anymore. My children are in the job market, my nieces, my nephews, my friends. It's what are the benefits? What's the health care? What's the health factor? Where do I walk? Where do I run? The safety? That's what's important. <clears throat> so I didn't get into this as a... Uh, people laughed when I, I used to present my $3,000 man who was a bird watcher. And I literally would pick out all the stuff he was wearing, his hat, his Zeiss lens, his camera. You start putting a price tag. This guy was walking around with $3,000 worth of stuff. He likes boutique hotels. He likes good meals. He buys books. He buys binoculars, things like that. So then the other thing I, I, I heard on an ABC newscast was that um, wildlife, fishing, bird watching, hunting, there's a greater economic impact than NASCAR fans. And I was laughed at. Well, I'm going to show you why that's true in the next couple of slides. So I didn't start my career or what I do. I'm passionate about regeneration, helping communities. So this is a community in Louisiana, Cameron Parish. 2,500 people live in the whole county. And it wasn't Katrina, it was Ike and Rita. So I went down there to see what I could do to help them. And this sunset is just phenomenal. This is where 60% of the shrimp and the crabs that you see in the supermarket comes from right here. They also have one of the biggest offshore oil drilling rigs. So I was going about my business and trying to help this place that had 250 people. So as I'm kind of poking around, I discover this. I first found it in the back of an Orvis catalog for their uh, hunting lodges. So I found this ad, this 18-person uh, hunting lodge, fishing lodge. What I want to point out here is this list right here. So you can rent this place from one to 18 people. It'll only cost you $9,000, $9,000. If you want a fly fishing boat or a trapping boat or a duck boat, it's only $500 more a day. That's economic impact. And you're down there, you feel like John Audubon. I got out of the car and go, wow, I just walked into a painting. But that put a whole different spin on every job I worked on after that. <clears throat> it's not just River Falls. It's not just Wisconsin. It's one of the largest and cleanest, I emphasize the word clean, global industries. 8% of the globe's economy is credited to tourism and recre uh, environmental recreation. 10% has an economic impact in terms of, again, money being uh, spent and taxes being generated. It's environmentally friendly, it promotes conservation and preservation, and it is utilizing the resources that we have. So what does it do? It creates jobs, it reduces migration of urban areas. Uh, we've all heard the term brain drain, things like that. So when you create an economy in a really beautiful, healthy place to live, and you have a job, you maintain your population. So it reduces that migration to the Twin Cities. So you want to live here. And I'd be curious, the migration between, and Patrick will talk about this, uh, La Crosse and Rochester and St. Paul and all the migrations of the small towns around them. It preserves your culture and natural resources. You know, people uh, talk about marinas all the time. Well, if you spent a ton of money on a boat. Would you want that boat to sit in dirty water? Do you want to launch your duck boat in a dirty river? It ties together. And then it celebrates authenticity. I think when people go on vacation, it's, it's always funny when I, when I do a workshop and, and people go, well, you know, I was at this town and that town, and wouldn't it be nice if our town was like that? So my advice to a lot of small towns in my workshops is, Design your town as if you wanted to go there for a vacation. Everybody wanted, wants to move to your town if it's nice. So why not create your own town that attracts people? Why are we spending thousands of dollars to go to another town when we could do that in our own town? So that's kind of an easy uh, kind of rule of thumb that I like to encourage people to think about. And Bob, who's presenting last, 
So some of the things I'm throwing out here, he'll explain how that thing gets folded into the next exercise. <clears throat> so the National Geographic, uh, Jim Dion, I met him three, four years ago. He's put this amazing presentation together. And the Na National Geographic is actually mapping the whole upper Mississippi. And uh, Jim just spent six months traveling 2,400 miles doing the Lewis and Clark Trail. And it's all on the website. It's all interactive. It tells you where to stay, where to eat. It, it tells a history. If you want heritage, if you want fishing, if you want walking, if you want riding, it's an amazing resource. But this is how they are starting to influence and convert these tourist asset, assets into a marketable product. So I can be coming from DC, Tallahassee, Seattle, Vancouver, Berlin, Tokyo, and they'll tell me to come to River Falls if we do it right. So whether it's fish and wildlife, forest service, BLM, or the DNRs of, you know, this is a quote from Alabama. I can show you the same statistics from Kansas, from Oklahoma, from Nebraska, from New York, from Massachusetts, from Ontario, Canada, Saskatchewan, that the hunting, fishing, and wildlife watching is huge. And these are just three statistics from the state of Alabama's DNR. Again, $626 million spent just in this one state. We've got 50 of them, by the way. And they're all similar in statistics. Now, some cost a little more to get to. Understood. You have to fly to Alaska, Hawaii. But it's phenomenal. And you'll see that the, the, some of the passive wildlife activity is generating more money than some of the more active. And it varies from state to state. Interactive activities, mixing it up. Fishing and canoeing and kayaking, bird watching. Uh, rafting, and in some states that's a major way to fish, is you raft some of these western rivers. We don't have that challenge here. The photographers, here again. This guy likes to eat well, he likes good wine or good beer. Uh, you're, you're looking at five to seven grand right there. He spends a lot of money when he comes visiting your community. And the interactiveness actually increases the economics. They're not conflicts. They actually build on each other, and they generate more revenue and stronger economy for the immediate area. <clears throat> the Forest Service, BLM, they have amazing statistics. But when you think of the Forest Service in this slide, for example, you're thinking of timber, Graze land, the, the pasture and grazing lands, the, the range cattle, sheep out west. Well, guess what? 45% of the jobs are just based on outdoor recreation. And that includes both active hunting, fishing, and more passive viewing of outdoor forms of, of life. And of course, some of the more traditional hiking, climbing, and um, camping. So if you. Here again, this is from the US Forest Service, and the Bureau of Land Management has similar statistics. But the biggest sector generating income is recreation. And you see how small the grazing is? And, you, and what was amazing for me were the forest products and the, uh, the mineral extraction, the, the third and fourth category, compared to the green category, which is uh, outdoor recreation, and again, it's not 646 million, it's billion, the B word. It's huge. Open space, you know, whether it's at a, at a city level, a county level, a state level, trails, park systems. Uh, this was from a study that was done in 05 for the DNR in uh, Jefferson County. So I'm going from the globe, now I'm back into Wisconsin. Uh, this is Jefferson County. It's uh, halfway between Milwaukee and Madison. And at the time, 13 million added value to the income and 420 jobs. I was just at an interview two weeks ago. Uh, they've got, they're trying to capitalize on the, on the uh, Ice Age Trail, which is very, uh, a big part of Jefferson County. But according to their 
2012-2017 plan, 12 years later, these numbers are tripling, just in 10 years. <clears throat> I've stated this earlier, I just wanted to make sure that these are not my quotes, these are not my statistics, and I want to give credit to the Forest Service, I want to give credit to the BLM and, and Paul McHugh and all these writers and all these people. But what's interesting here, how many are familiar with the Elroy Sparta Trail? That was done in the late 60s. Again, that's a long time ago, isn't it? And imagine how we were talking about trails back then. And Wisconsin, by the way, is the largest trails to, uh, rails to trails state in the 48 continental states. But this was a quote that during peak season, this is, uh, I think this is like in the 90s, this quote, 1995 or 96. So the trail had been working for, for 20 years plus, that a year before, all the rooms are booked up for the summer and the people using that trail. If you were an innkeeper, isn't that a nice problem to have? There's another statistic that I, I'll share. I wanted to put it up here. There's a trail in, um, in uh, Pennsylvania, and I, I'll mispronounce it. I, I think of Yinling Beer, but it's not quite like that. It's a, it's a famous trail in Pennsylvania. There was an old industrial building that they converted to a cafe and think of the character of the, the Elroy Sparta Trail. You know, it's, it's not like downtown on, you know, South Fork on, the, on Main Street. Over a thousand meals a day. Imagine that, a thousand meals. <clears throat> so our friend, Mr. Audubon, who did these wonderful paintings and about hunting and fishing and exotic birds, uh, he really got it when he documented these incredible areas, which a lot of them now are conservation areas. But this again comes from uh, a combination of the bird watching community and the wildlife community. It gives you an idea of the demographics of, in this case, is a 67.8 million. And you see the breakdown in men versus women, they're almost half. And then you see the age breakdown where the bulk, the highest percentage is probably in the late 20s, early 30s uh, till the 60s in terms of people that are avid bird watchers. Uh, it represents 46 million of, of these observers in, in the majority of, of the flyways. Uh, 32 billion a year is spent on the hobby. 32 billion, that's on stuff. Um, and again, where does the money go? Where does it come from? What do we have to tap into? Over 13 billion in state and federal taxes. That's a lot of money. But the other thing that was interesting, and the statistic varied a little from state to state, but I would say it's fair to say that almost half of these people that hunt fish and watch wildlife, they're of the ones that participated in surveys, uh, their income was above $75,000 a year. That's pretty healthy, 75,000 a year. That's the kind of visitor you want to come and Again, stop in at the diner and have a cup of coffee or have a nice meal. Open space systems in general, from coast to coast. Uh, these initials up here, these acronyms, APA, ULI, ASLA, these are all professional societies that deal with planners, landscape architects, designers, uh, urban development, investment, the Urban Land Institute that almost any of these communities and developments and investments <clears throat> where there's a major open space or trail systems, that property or that neighborhood has an increase of 15% in their value, 15%. And uh, again, I, I live in Madison, uh, the Southwest Trail. When a house goes for sale, the for sale sign does not go on the street. It goes on the bike trail. What does that tell you? You don't need to be a rocket scientist or a, you know, a real estate brain, you know, brain guy. The marina industry, the golf industry, marinas, houses on parks, houses on golf courses. 15% of the people that live there don't golf, they don't boat. They buy there because of the environment. Reser again, residential property on the trails I just mentioned, is, it's like being on a park it automatically jacks the price up. So 
we can't leave the outdoor recreation out. So I talked about a lot of agencies. So here's a private sector, here's industry that makes the stuff that people buy. So the job creation from the industry's perspective, over six million jobs are created. Six and a half billion, again the B word, spending a year in the, from the outdoor recreation's perspective, they're saying that almost 40 billion of taxes are generated from the stuff they sell. Windbreakers, climbing ropes, shoes, backpacks, cameras, all that good stuff. And again, the local impact is almost as big as the federal impact, another 40 billion, the B word, in local state tax revenue. So about a third of the six and a half billion is making the stuff, and the other two thirds of the six and a half billion is how do I get there, where do I sleep, what do I eat, what do I put in my gas tank, what do I put in my cooler to keep the fish cool. As you compare that six and a half or six, 650 billion to some of these other things, it's interesting to see outdoor recreation at six, six, uh, 646 and pharmaceuticals at 331. I never would have thought that. I know you can't get aspirin on the trail, but they make so much money. This just puts it into perspective how powerful and how healthy the outdoor recreation number is. The only thing that beats it out is the financial world and our health our healthcare world. So I'm gonna go through a couple of quick case studies and then I'll be done. So um, last time I presented the corridor, just to give a sense of what a corridor plan is, uh, some of you came up to me and said, well, you know, how many were at that first Tech Talk? Okay. Wow, impressive. I think you all get a merit badge. <laughs> uh, the intent was just to kind of illustrate what a quarter plan is and how many different kinds of quarter plans are, and economics was a bit of it. And there are some examples of Sheboygan's redevelopment, the waterfront Racine, Detroit. And a few of you came up to me and said, well, you know, we're not Racine, we're not Detroit. We're River Falls. I said, okay, <laughs> I understand. So I'm gonna show you five communities. Uh, who knows what the population is at River Falls? How many? About 15,000. Give that person a brownie. <laughs> 15,000. So the next series of images you're gonna see represent a series of communities that uh, the smallest one is about 2,500. The biggest one is 10,000. Uh, three of them are three, 4,000, 5,000, then there's one in there for 7,000. They're not big. They're a lot like you. Actually, they're smaller than you. So if I were to say, okay, I've got some raffle tickets in my pocket, and uh, who would be interested in going on a trip, a vacation in a place like this? Is there an interest to kind of remind you of home or what you want to have home be? And why wouldn't I go to a place like this? So remember that list I said, I shared in the beginning, infrastructure, community services. That's the winner from this picture, you know? Here again, wouldn't we all like to live here? Well, the money and the revenue that comes from outdoor recreation, hunting and fishing results in that. An amazing arts program, center, active theater, restaurants on the river, Black Bear, great place. This is their vibrant little downtown. Breckenridge, Colorado. The Blue River, some of the best fishing I've ever done. And by the way, I've either lived and worked on all these communities. Uh, the story behind Breckenridge, here again, aside from the fact that you gotta get there in the winter time, uh, all these cities, by the way, are one to two hours from major cities. How far are the Twin Cities? Hour plus, hour minus? Yeah, and some of them, they're like three and a half, four hours from Montreal, New York, and Boston. So you've got a place that people want to be, but you don't have to deal with all that stuff that you deal with in the big city. The other thing that's interesting about this beautiful trout stream, you know what a brownfield is? Contaminated, dirty, 
The blue was contaminated and dirty. Why? The mining. All the mine tailings polluted and destroyed this river. Now it's one of the best trout fishing you can imagine. This is what it's like now downtown. Fourth of July, a regular day, and here the blue is in its full glory. Jackson Hole, you know, whether you're after elk, buffalo, a good float trouting expedition, fabulous kayaking, <clears throat> the Grand Tetons, and of course, a wonderful criterion. And here it is, life 24-7, 12 months. It's public square, it's transportation, little play on the, uh, on the elk, uh, great place to live, great place to make a living. <clears throat> Another Woodstock, buddy, sorry, Albuquerque isn't the only place to have great balloon risings. <laughs> uh, you can imagine fishing on a beautiful morning you know, and having the reflections off in the distance or the Billings Farm with a blue, <coughs> blue, a blue ribbon uh, dairy, dairy herd. Each, each cow, she produces about 100 pounds of milk a day. And then there's dinner. It's awesome. Uh, I lived there and I used to fish on one side of the bridge and the other side of the bridge the high school kids were swimming. Again, this coexistence, this happiness that the river provides it. And this old mill now is an amazing uh, glass-blowing studio from an with an Irishman and an uh, unbelievable restaurant. And this is living, this is where I lived, right there on the green, in a place that was started <clears throat> in 1781. And what would it be without a healthy hardware store? Freeport, Maine. It's been around for a long time. Whether it's a backwoods cabin or on the ocean, unbelievable coastal kayaking and canoeing. I've spent many, uh, many a weekend camping on the islands, and it wouldn't be anything without L.L. Bean, which became its anchor. We're going to the South Freeport Lobster Pound for a, for a couple of lobster that are dirt cheap because you live there. Population seven, 8,000 people. That's what it is like downtown now. It's healthy. The UPS uh, distribution, three million a year. Packaging and, se and sending everything that the people buy on the street and buy from L.L. Bean. Uh, when I was in college, we'd come up here at midnight for a cup of coffee and raspberry pie, be back home for breakfast. It's still as great, and I'm almost 67, and I still go back there with great memories. So, everything I just showed you is very doable. Where does the money come from? It comes from the investment. It comes from the stewardship of the natural resources. It provides a quality of life that you build on, that you share with the tourists, that then provide employment and tax base, and lets you afford wellness and health and richness in cultural and community services. So 1920, pretty much the way it is today. So Bob will tell, what, tell you what's going to happen in October, but what do we want to put in this square? I hope that what I've shared shows you that it's very possible. People live like that now in other beautiful places. And when we get together, let's build on this information and answer the, the collective agenda that we can generate as a community. It's not coming from me as a consultant or a speaker. It's got to come from you as a participant. You've got to own it. <clears throat> and I'm going to end with this quote because uh, sometimes when we, when we talk about problem statements or challenges and, you know, whether you're trying to outgrow your sneakers or your jeans, uh, we're, we're a org living organism and a river is no different. So I like this quote because it says a river is a river. Well, that's a no-brainer. And yet the water flowing through it is never still. And the water that's there right now, it's not going to be there in five minutes, 24 hours. It's ever changing. The use of the river has ever changed. When you walk through that hallway and you see all those fabulous pictures, it's a different place. And when you go there tomorrow, next week, or this winter, it's going to be a different place every time. And so we're in a position now to come up with a corridor plan that will help make that quote even better. So with that, I'm going to end. And uh, is Patrick ready to come up next? 
And I guess uh, we'll allow questions afterwards, right? Yeah. So let's give Ed a hand. Uh, thank you. Ed, appreciate it. We're going to queue up Patrick's uh, presentation here, but uh, I'll give him a little introduction to get started. So Patrick Sieb is the director of the Economic and D Development and Placemaking for something called the Destination Medical Center Economic Development Agency. And some of you may have heard of this little project that's going on down in the city of Rochester. It's actually a 20-year long economic development project, the largest in, in Minnesota history. And it's really built around medical tourism and bringing people to Rochester and, and how they can create more of a destination. So uh, undoubtedly, you've been there or have had family mem members who've gone there for medical uh, types of procedures, the reasons why, why you go to the, to the Mayo Clinic. And yet, there's more for Rochester to do to create that, that destination feel. And so when we first started talking about speakers to, to bring in, and I had a chance to meet Patrick a couple years ago, he seemed like a, a natural to come and talk about what does that mean, this idea of destination and, and placemaking, since that's his number one job? The bonus was that he also spent 20 years as the executive director of the St. Paul Riverfront Corporation, where he is credited with catalyzing, catalyzing and directing more than $4 billion in new investments in the city of St. Paul. So we have the combination of how to create destination with this idea of waterfront development and economic development. And I think it, it really means that Patrick's the perfect speaker to address this issue for us today. So Patrick. Thank you. Uh, wow, what a wonderful crowd to look out on to and to uh, be a part of. And Mark, I want to thank you for the kind invitation to be a part of this process. and. I want to thank Buddy for his leadership uh, um, in this community and the role he's playing in facilitating this process. I know that it really takes a, a, the kind of staff person you are to help facilitate this very important community conversation. When I first started work in city building and city design, um, somebody said to me, somebody far more experienced than me, said to me, if there's anything you want to get done in your city, and if it takes five years, uh, rather, if, it, if, if you expect it will take a year, but if it's on the, on the water, add five years to that. And it's, and it's because people care passionately about their communities. They care passionately about their natural environment and the, and the characteristics that make their community special. And so as I uh, look out at this crowd, I can see and feel and, and and moved by the kind of energy that exists here and the kind of passion that exists here. Um, as uh, this slide says, I'm uh, currently uh, Director of Economic Development and Placemaking for Destination Medical Center in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm also a senior research fellow with the University of Minnesota, where I participate in the College of Design, in the work that's going on, in the thinking about the connection between urban and rural environments, urban and rural communities and formerly uh, executive director of St. Paul Riverfront Corporation, as, as Mark mentioned. And if you use social media, uh, uh, feel free to connect with me um, or use these hashtags uh, tonight if you are uh, inclined to use social media. But I think the most important credential I have in being here is I, I love River Falls and I've spent a lot of time on the streams here and, and nearby. And I had great plans today to get out uh, to get out fishing, uh, uh, but uh, life got in the way, so I had to uh, borrow from my camera roll to, uh, to grab some pictures. I rarely catch fish this big, I just want to be clear about that, <laughs> and, uh, but I do um, often get out on the streams here. And of course, Rochester is, um, is in the uh, a great uh, world-class fly fishing as well. My presentation, I'm going to spend a portion of my presentation talking about Rochester and the work we're doing there. And, uh, and I, want to, I want to frame it in a way that I think connects the, the thinking that's going on in Rochester with the thinking that's going on in River Falls. And while our cities are very different in many ways, um, there are similarities in what compels us as communities to think forward, think ahead. Um, so, so 
most people only know of Rochester because of Mayo Clinic. It is the world's, rather the country's best hospital, probably the world's best hospital, um, consistently ranked the top in the country. Um, f many people don't realize that it has a very robust education program. It attracts students in their medical degree program, in their graduate school, in their School of Health Sciences. So it is a, 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 uh, uh, an extremely, has an extremely uh, robust education program. If you, if you look back at this image, there are three shields in, this, in the logo that is Mayo Clinic. And one of those cl shields represents clinical, another of the shields represents education, and the third shield represents research. There is uh, nearly, three, nearly $700 million worth of research that goes on in the Mayo system, uh, much of it in Rochester, uh, over a million square feet of, um, of, of lab space dedicated to research. Um, uh, um, the, the number of patents and publications coming out of Mayo, Mayo is extraordinary. Considered one of the best research institution, medical research institutions in the country. Again, many people don't realize that or aren't aware of it. Their research is really organized around how do they immediately translate new knowledge into patient care? How do we go from the bench to the bedside? How do we affect and translate outcomes for patients under their care? I say all of this because Mayo is the economic engine for Rochester. And so when anything that is contemplated in terms of the future of Rochester draws from that economic engine, as should any city as it looks at its future. So $9.8 billion economic impact, more than 1.3 million patients come to Rochester every year from 140 countries. There are 64,000 male employees around the state of Minnesota. A bit about Rochester now. So that's, that's Mayo, just a quick overview of Mayo. A bit about Rochester, a population of 110,000 people. It's well-educated. Um, nearly everybody graduates from high school. 70% of the population is college-educated. It has a recreational bike trail that rivals any in the state, 100 miles of paved trails. Median income of $63,000, so, so um, generally people are doing well financially. Um, but it's a very diverse community, um, 80 languages spoken. Uh, this is the kind of image we like to use when we tell people what Rochester is like. But if you travel down Highway 52 and enter Rochester, this is uh, more of what you see upon entering the city. And in many ways, it is the difference between this, what we want to be, and this, what we are, is really what DMC is all about. This says health, and this says vitality, and this says young people, and this says nature, and this says McDonald's. And Kentucky Fried Chicken, and automobiles, and uh, not really very many people. Bird's eye view is even more dramatic. This very tight campus surrounded by an ocean of asphalt. And I think that's a river right over there somewhere. If I could find this, uh, yeah, I think that's a river there, not sure. Yes, thank you, thank you, that's, that's yes, yes, that now it works. So, the punchline would have worked better if this light worked, but I think that's the river, I think that's a river right here, so. So Destination Medical Center is really about understanding this uh, incredible asset we have called Mayo and the changing medical environment, uh, dramatic change going on in the medical environment. But on the other side, this change in what communities and what people expect of their communities, this reurbanization trend. So our mission at Destination Medical Center is position Rochester as the world's premier destination for health and wellness, 
to attract people, investment, and jobs, and to support Minnesota's growth. Not just Rochester's growth, but Minnesota's growth. It is really that narrative um, in a much more sophisticated way that compelled the state of Minnesota to agree to participate in Rochester's transformation. And they said if Mayo, in fact, is going to invest another three and a half billion dollars into Rochester, and if the private sector is going to invest two, over two billion dollars, we, the state of Minnesota will support that investment through rather support those investments in public by providing up to $585 million for public infrastructure, for sewers and roads and sidewalks and brownfield cleanup and the kind of things you have to do to get a city ready for this kind of investment. They said that in order to go past to, to, to move past go, however, you need to create a development plan. You need to bring your community together, bring your community together, much like this. And it was over about a 12-month process to result in a development plan that would be adopted by the community, adopted by the state, and it became the guiding direction for future investment public investment, infrastructure investment, and private investment. This is a video, I'm not gonna play it. So it's not just a black screen, I just wanna, just want you to know. If you, if you drill down and look at all of the planning documents and all of the conversations in the community, community and, and try to distill it into a set of values and principles. Really four things emerge as the things that are most important to the community of Rochester. Now these are not the four things that might be important to this community or to St. Paul or to Wyzetta, but these are four things that really bubble up as the things most important to the community. Health and wellness, place-based, people first, and innovation. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes on this because I think the most important thing that will come out of the work you're doing as a community is, is a, a, a common understanding, a shared appreciation for the kind of values that, that is reflective of this community and that every decision you make, every investment decision you make that gets made in this community should be measured against those values. Because whatever plan you lay down, lay, you lay down today will be out of date at some point in the future, whether it's a year or five years, but we can only know so much today in terms of specific projects. But these kinds of values live with you, they predate you, and they will live on beyond you and beyond any single plan. So health and wellness, place-based, people-first innovation. This idea of understanding that in our case, in Rochester's case, that, that a lot of people are there for medical treatment, for health care. But people also are looking for ways to live, to be healthy, to live healthy lives, to pursue wellness, not just sickness care, not just sickness care. This idea of how do we think about building our city with health and wellness in mind, to, to foster physical activity, to uh, create environments for access to healthy food, to give people, uh, to ensure that we have clean air and fresh air, and that our buildings are built to the health and wellness standards. Place-based. This idea that we experience our cities through place, not through buildings, but through places. I showed you this example earlier. You know, if this is what we aspire to be, this place of, of green and, and uh, pedestrian and human scale, and yet we're dealing with this. 
people first. Again, and you heard it in uh, Ed's presentation, that you build your city for people. You build your city for local people. And outsiders will come to love it. This idea of human scale, this is a, an example of an initiative we ran called a prototyping, uh, prototyping festival where we got the community together to test ideas, to test new concepts. So, so this, this is a, a little parklet that was installed in the middle of the street so people could test out some new ideas for how parks could get built. This is a crosswalk that re rethought what crosswalks should look like if we really want people first, not cars first. How do you design crosswalks that tell, that tell automobiles this is for, for people? Seating, uh, public seating, instead of the sort of stiff uh, uh, metal park benches that we're so accustomed to, is there different kinds of seating that promotes interaction and conversation? This is, uh, mu this is chimes, uh, the idea that you could um, have musical instruments in the parks that people could interact with. Innovation. I mentioned that, re that, that Mayo is home to nearly three quarters of a billion dollars worth of research every year. That innovation is baked into the culture of Rochester, but it's really been internalized. It's inside dark buildings that you can't get to with mirrored glass and, and uh, secure doors and all kinds of signals that you can't be a part of it. And this idea that innovation should be exposed and that we should create more environments for people to interact with each other. That we foster startup companies. Uh, all of these are, are companies that tap into Mayo in intellectual property and, and technology that we create new environments. This is actually a Google campus, but this is an inspirational image for us to say, what's the, what's the future buildings look like? If, if we don't want the buildings that say, don't go here, we want buildings that say, come here. We want buildings that foster interaction. So health and wellness, place-based, people first, innovation as values that we really aspire to and all of our projects should live up to. I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the model that we're using. Um, we call our 21st century approach to city building. I mentioned urban prototyping. Again, this notion that in every other industry but city development typically, in every other industry people build test models. They build demonstration projects. They build prototypes. They test things out before they put it out to market. But so often in cities, we build streets and roads or bridges. We build uh, uh, parks without ever actually modeling how they would feel, what, what that experience would be like. Putting in a demonstration project, closing a street for a festival as a way of demonstrating what would it be like if that street were closed all of the time. So the idea of, of, of prototyping. this. This one on the top I'm really excited about. This is a, a, a light, an art installation using light. But what's exciting about it is that this artist got Mayo to agree to make data available about what's happening inside of the hospital and clinic. Um, it, was sort of, it was, of course, de-identified, de so nobody would know who this data was coming from. But, but this, this light, and this, again, is just a test model, uh, changes colors, it becomes uh, violet when a baby is born. It becomes uh, uh, amber color when somebody finishes chemotherapy. Um, but this whole idea of, of, of translating what's happening inside of Mayo to the community so the community can, can celebrate with, with Mayo. I talked about the seating, this, um, this uh, prototyping of uh, new ways of thinking about public seating. So these are, these are stools that are uh, tied together and are, they're on casters, on wheels, so you can move them around and, and you can cluster you know, a couple of people to sit together if they want or bring a whole group together. And so different arrangements based on the configuration of the group that might be gathered. 
so, so 21st century approach, urban prototyping, uh, translational research, this whole idea of how do we as city builders, as people building our communities, use technology to advance our work? How do we use um, augmented reality or virtual reality to experience the future of our city before we build it? So oftentimes we, we have disagreements in communities and there should be disagreements. You don't have a healthy community if you don't have disagreements. But we don't have the tools or we haven't tapped into the tools to help create shared experiences of what are we disagreeing about anyway? Do we even know what we're disagreeing about? So using virtual reality, the headsets that you could put on where you could imagine what a, uh, you could actually see what a future building could look like or what that relationship to the river might be. Uh, technology. Uh, well Living Lab in Rochester actually is a, a laboratory of Mayo Clinic and Delos, a, a development company out of New York that's testing the impact of the indoor environment on human health, health and productivity. So lighting and acoustics and uh, furniture. How do, how, do people, uh, how do people respond from a physical point of view um, with different tech, different uh, features of the indoor environment. Years ago, and I, 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 we were talking about uh, this idea of community controversy. Years ago, this is probably not so true today, but um, years ago when I was uh, working in St. Paul and, and um, uh, I had a meeting in Detroit uh, follow, uh, on, a, on a Wednesday, let's say, and on Tuesday night, I was um, in, in a public meeting uh, dealing with a, a road configuration. And this was a public meeting that lasted well into the night. Um, uh, many people turned out, a room much like this, people very passionate on one end or the other about how that road would be designed. And the next day, I was in Detroit, and I was talking to my counterpart in Detroit. And I was, thought I was going to be commiserating with him about lengthy public meetings and community controversy. And he looked at me and he said, do you have any idea how fortunate you are? That people care enough to disagree, to have a point of view, and to share that point of view? Because when I have a public meeting, nobody shows up. And it, it was really a seminal moment for me in understanding the value and understanding and appreciating what community engagement and community uh, uh, conversation and sometimes controversy, what it really means. Finally, new economy. This idea, what do communities look like in the future? And what do we as community leaders have to do to prepare our community for what the future looks like? That as Ed said, pe people today choose their city before they choose their job. People are looking for quality of life, not quantity. They're looking for quality of life. They're looking how do they connect locally and globally. And the biggest competition out there today is attracting young people. Cities who do not win the battle of attracting young people will be out of business in 25 years. And you can drive across Wisconsin, or Minnesota. I was in the UP over the weekend at a diner in a small town in the UP. And I can look at the faces in that diner and I can tell you that town will not exist in 25 years if it does not work to win the battle of attracting young people. We call that new economy. Now, I'm going to just say a couple of things about St. Paul and, and, and another waterfront city, Wyzetta, that I worked in. So St. Paul, I spent 25, 20 years working in riverfront development. And uh, I think St. Paul did a better job than anybody cutting people off from their river. I mean, if it wasn't just the railroads and the polluted post-industrial locations. We also were really good at chain link fences. 
So we had, we were, we were most, the most inhospitable river city that one could imagine. And we were competing against, by the way, uh, a lot of really bad cities. <laughs> but I think we did as well as Pittsburgh or Cincinnati or uh, Cleveland. Um, I think we did as well as any at cutting people off. Our work, which was embodied in this thing called St. Paul and the Mississippi Development Framework, which is in, in its 20th year this year, 2017, is its 20th year as a, as a framework. And while this 175-page document or 300-page document, I don't remember what, while many of the specific projects that were contemplated in that are no longer relevant today. Some have been completed and some have, have not and some many new things have emerged. What has withstood the test of time are these 10 principles. So when I talked earlier about Rochester's four core values and I talk about how important what come, will hopefully come out of your process is a set of principles or guiding values. These are 10 that, that have driven St. Paul and its investment decisions, evoke a sense of place, restore a unique urban ecology. I won't go through them all, but uh, historic preservation and a balanced network for, for movement and transportation and fostering public safety. These are all goals that are today used in every conversation about development. Similarly in YZ, uh, we did a project in Wyzetta, another great waterfront city where I think there's a lot of parallels to opportunities here in, in River Falls. Uh, we led their community planning process. And if you look at their main street, there's a lot of similarity between the main street there and, and here. Of course, they're on a lake, not on, on a river. Uh, but, but they came up with a set of values. And of course, they're different than the values from St. Paul, and they're different than the values from Rochester. In fact, their first, their first value is to be YZ. I think it was their way of saying, we don't want to be Excelsior. <laughs> they said things like embrace the lake and thoughtful economic growth. My favorite one of all, though, reimagine the room. My favorite one of all, lively but not rowdy. Lively but not rowdy. It, it was, uh, and, and that, that phrase is used uh, uh, over and over again. Every development is like, okay, will this make us more lively or is it going to tip the balance and we're going to become this sort of rowdy city that we don't want to be? So, in, I mentioned I wanted to get out fly fishing before today's meeting, but I, I, I just couldn't get here until uh, 6 o'clock. But I did get out for a walk, and, and I wanted to just walk this community to think about where are you today in terms of embracing the river? And in just a very brief walk, I saw lots and lots of cues about what you are doing and how you're turning your face to this incredible resource. And you'll recognize all of these images, of course. Um, I think that's City Hall, right? Signage, art on the Kinney, this simple gestures like flowers, this overlook, simple gestures like this. Storefronts that open on both the river side and the main street side. And people out with their dogs. Dog cities are the most lively cities of all. Dog friendly cities, most lively cities of all. Event series like music in the park that go throughout the, that cater to different audiences. Different people will want to participate in different parts of the series. And, and of course, this great event you do every year in September. Storefronts that tell us that we're on the river. Look around for cues of this community embracing the river. You guys have a running start. You have a running start um, by the physical cues, but also by the 
human cues and the, and the people that are here. So with that, I just want to thank you. It's so great to be in a river community and to see so many passionate people. Thank you very much. Patrick, thanks again. A, a great presentation. And, and, and kind of thinking a little bit about tonight, and, and so we're going to queue up our third speaker here in just a minute. Uh, Ed Freer talked a lot about the importance of outdoor recreation and tourism and this idea and left us with some images of, of what could be and, and I think it really played into what Patrick talked about in, in, with Rochester and earlier in, in St. Paul, uh, having a plan and, and a plan that really lays out more what are we going to be. Our next speaker is Bob Cost. Bob Cost is a senior planner with SEH. He's, work on some things and working on some things with Patrick in Rochester right now, a, an important trail project called the City Loop. Um, with, and he's worked here in, in River Falls before on the downtown project. Bob's role for our work here now is to, to bring ideas together of what we could be and then how we bring that forward to, to develop a plan, a plan for the corridor, not only what we're going to be, but how we actually get there and what that implementation plan is going to look like. And one of the first big steps to that, and you see some signage and you see it in your, in your flyer, is about a big community planning event that will be coming up here at the end of October called the Charette. I'm going to let Bob tell you about that in, uh, in just a few minutes after we'll start getting into questions. So, Bob? Okay. Um, advancing slides. Right. This guy here. Yep. Good evening. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you the origins of the word charrette if you got a smartphone or you're in a library so <laughs> go for it so we developed this diagram a while back to um, get our committee and everyone in the room to understand kind of the process we've been going through we're doing a lot of community engagement we've had we're on our sixth tech talk, right? We did a big meeting back in November. We've had a survey, we've done all sorts of good stuff. Uh, we've been busy doing inventory and analysis. Uh, we've had a lot of community input. We're looking at a variety of ways for that stuff to come together against a set of uh, what I'll call frameworks, man-made systems, natural systems, political systems, economic systems, all of that good stuff been built, we've talked about it, and now we're going to get together and put our hands on the plant as a community. So what's a design charrette? Um, and what you see here are photographs of activities uh, that we've been involved with in a variety of cities doing this kind of work. Essentially it's an inclusive hands-on process that harnesses the talents and energies of citizens, decision makers, and designers to create supportable, feasible plans for making great places. And each one of these participants is absolutely critical, which is why we come together for a period of days. That way we don't have some folks in a back room or out in an office doing a bunch of design work who come to a meeting and some people come and some people don't. Uh, we make some decisions, other people see it, then it gets reviewed, then we come back to some more meetings and we continually kind of rework and revisit questions and, and kind of tire each other out. So given all the background, all the work we've done to date, what we're trying to do is to get everybody together who make decisions, who have passion and ideas, and have some talent and experience, that's the design team, to translate your ideas into some images, into some drawings, into some designs for us all to kind of look at together. Bill Leonards, who's the developer of the National Charette Institute, a uh, longtime planner and good guy, uh, kind of describes it as it's part old fashioned New England town meeting and part barn raising. So if you can think about, we've kind of been having those uh, old fashioned New England town meetings over the last few months, uh, taking your questions, having input, having discussions with the committee, thinking of ideas, um, and the barn raising is gonna be when we all get our hands on, on ideas and start to flesh them out. So why would we do a charrette? Well, part of the reason we do it from the planning perspective as I was describing is we wanna to try to reduce uncertainty. 
uncertainty for you where it's, what are these guys cooking up? I didn't make that meeting. Did you see what they did? I don't know. They said we're going to work on it some more. Come back tomorrow. A couple of weeks go by. Uh, yeah, they're still working on it. You miss another meeting. Somebody doesn't show up. Oh, sorry, too late. We've made the decision. So we try to get a transparent, holistic, methodical process where we can reduce some of that uncertainty by identifying, exploring, and evaluating options together. So who's involved? We're going to run this thing for about three and a half days. So we'll start. Uh, there's a schedule coming up. But essentially, we'll start on a Wednesday night. We'll get together on Thursday as a studio. We're going to work out of the library. So the doors are open. It's a public space. We'll be doing public design in public with the public. Um, we'll run for, generally, these things run from three to seven days. Ours is going to run for about three and a half days. Again, we'll use this holistic approach where we'll be looking at social, environmental, engineering, economics, architecture, urban design, all the things we've been having these tech talks about, which is why we've set these up sequentially from one to six, so that as a community, and I've seen a lot of the same faces here over and over again, is we've had these discussions about, like tonight, with economic development and recreation and before about what happens when we take the dams out and what happens with the sentiment. And uh, you know what about the fish and all these other things that we've been dealing with, right? So we all now have a sort of shared conversation and a set of baseline conditions we can react to. We put everybody's hands on the plans who can show up and participate. It includes decisions, drawings, presentations. And again, we're kind of in the weeds on planning jargon, but the idea is that we have these feedback loops, right? So again, you see these people in these pictures they aren't actors playing uh, community members. <laughs> They're real community members. And these are real processes, just like we're going through. The idea is we'll start out on our first evening, and we'll have exercises and conversations around visioning and programming. Right? We've kind of defined the project. We're doing this corridor planning study. We've done a lot of technical work. So now, uh, between now and then, we'll be working with your committee um, to, as Patrick pointed out, to craft uh, some basic guiding principles or values that will serve as some evaluation criteria so we can look at designs and just not have a beauty contest. So that's our first touch point with all of you. We'll go into the studio. The studio will be open. We'll be doing exploring and designing and have some informal reviews on that Thursday. We'll do some refining on Friday and actually have another public meeting that after, late afternoon where we'll do pinups. We'll do presentations, we'll answer questions, we'll argue a little bit, we'll decide if somebody's crazy or somebody's a genius, and we'll go back on Saturday, actually Friday night for us, work a lot in the evening, work all day Saturday, sketch more things up, clean things up, and then on Saturday afternoon, preferred scenarios based on input from all of you, will be pinned up and we'll have another set of conversations. And we'll have done some work and advanced the process so that together as you move forward to make your decision about relicensing and other things on the corridor, we've got a sound, sound basis of having explored and looked at what are the machinations, what are the ideas, what's starting to make sense. This won't be the last time we get together and do this kind of work. It's really the first time. Um, if we go back to this diagram, you'll see as alternative scenarios get vetted and you start making your city council decision about you know, what you're really going to do with the hydroelectric uh, facilities, we'll come back and have a follow-up workshop because we'll have one part of the question answered and the, the sort of future will be a little clearer at that point. But we'll also have done all this design work that then we can refine into uh, a real corridor plan which is what you know, the rest of the next year is going to be about. So detailed schedule, as I kind of pointed out to you, we'll start out. Our team will come to River Falls on Wednesday. We'll build a design studio in the library. At 6.30, um, we'll have a community meeting, again, as we've had for the last uh, almost year. We'll have food. We'll have beverages. We'll have tables. We'll have people. Um, we'll have tools and things we need to have those conversations. It will be orchestrated 
it won't just be willy-nilly, what do you think, what do I think? We'll actually have some exercises that will get us uh, down the road. As I said, we'll be thinking about programming. So what are the program elements that people want to see along the corridor for the future? We're working with this Kitty Corridor Committee. So we'll have input with our committee multiple times through the process. We'll be having lunch with them on Thursday after we've done some work. We'll continue to do work again on Thursday, Friday, have some more conversations. We'll have some technical meetings with folks like Reed and Amy and Buddy and others at the city, uh, asking some questions, testing some hypotheses, making sure things pass the smell test on a reality basis. And then again, on Friday evening, we'll have a review session, actually Friday afternoon review session to about 6.30. Our team comes back, does some more work. We work all day Saturday and um, we wrap it up. So why do we want to do this in a set of compressed multiple days? The compressed and action-oriented process lets people, you all, all of us, see our ideas being tested and reflected in plans and sketches. So here's uh, the work of Ed Freer done over about a four hour period, looking at a floating dock system. This is a project uh, I actually worked with Amy on about a, maybe three years ago on the river in La Crosse. So these are the kinds of drawings, they're loose, um, they're not totally definitive, but we'll also be doing some computer work because we've got some good models and we've got some definitive things. So we kind of blend uh, what I would say sort of the loose and conceptual with some of the tighter and, and refined but we do a series of drawings and sketches and plan section and, and other ways so that you can start to see what that happens. When we do it in a compressed period of time, it really allows us to focus and it really allows you guys to get your hands on the plans and start to see that, oh, I just talked to Bob yesterday afternoon and we talked about, you know, we really want to see that we'd love the river walk to be this brick overlay and uh, we want lights on the ceiling. And, Everybody thinks that's a cool idea. Well, we'll get that sketch drawn up and show you what that might look like. So what's your role? For the committee, it's really about information, ideas, critiques. You're the ambassadors, right? You've been representing various factions and various people you know and yourselves over the last year, and you'll continue to do that. So you'll have hands-on directing our work as you've already done, um, but also, you know, pushing people that you know to make sure they get out and come out and visit us and participate. For community members, it's really about your ideas, your information, your energy. You're the experts here. You live here. You experience River Falls for 10 years, 20 years, your whole life. Um, those are the things that we need to know as designers, those little things about how when you access the, the river in this one location, um, you find that it's not real safe, or it changes, uh, it's really slippery. So maybe that's a great place that we should be looking at some stone steps, right? Or maybe there's some places where we really need to deal with some invasive species, uh, you know, that are preventing a view. So it's that little detail kind of stuff that we're going to be addressing uh, at a variety of levels, and you're the experts who know that. City staff, again, guiding us with technical data and information. And our role as consultants is really organizing this process, facilitating the process, and bringing a lot of talent and energy so we can help make your ideas kind of sing and shine. How do you participate? Again, a series of some images from these kinds of activities. Large group, listening, review, critiques, comments. So when we have the first meeting, the second meeting, and the third public meeting, again, here at the library, um, it's, we'll be doing some talking, but you'll be doing some talking back at us, so it'll be conversational. There'll also be small group work, so again, on that first night, as I talked about, we'll be doing some visioning wordplay, some programming, scenario, future casting. Uh, the committee is really, again, about reviewing and commenting and guiding, um, and for all of you, it's really about the same and visiting the studio. So will we consider multiple options and ideas? Absolutely. There is no one idea here. Nothing is baked. 
no decisions have been made, uh, regardless of what you've heard or what you think you've heard. Um, so here's just an infographic that we've worked on that kind of gets at some of these notions of uh, we can look at dams remaining with hydroelectric production. And so what does that mean for the future of, of the corridor? We can look at you know, restoring the falls at the lower dam. We can look at uh, you know, one dam and restoring that area, reworking the lakes, reworking both lakes uh, with no hydroelectric. Um, that work has uh, advanced pretty substantially with friends from the Kinney, so we've got a pretty good understanding of, of some of that. But a lot of these other ideas really haven't been explored. So um, these are just one handful of, of ways we want to start to approach and we'll be organizing the work. Everyone's invited. Bring your ideas, bring your questions, concerns. Mostly bring your passion. Um, and let's make the corridor a better place than it is today. Questions? Thanks. Bob, thanks for the presentation. Why well, we've got about uh, 10 minutes here left. I'm going to invite all three speakers, if you wouldn't mind coming up. And if you've used the card at your place and want to just hold it up, we've got some people are going to go on. We'll try to ask, uh, answer a few of these questions tonight. Uh, all the questions will be answered in writing and posted to the uh, project website. So again, your efforts in, in uh, asking good questions and, uh, and us trying to get answers just helps again to continue the conversation and build that, uh, that knowledge. So. So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, ground truthing here as we go through and see what we're going to You, if you want to just hand them to me, we'll kind of go through them. So first one, um, I think I'm going to direct to Ed. Ed, uh, you said that uh, who would want to live in the big city when you could live in one of these five places? You showed a number of images um, and talked about a number of communities. I brought and raised my family in River Falls and live in a relaxing city without a bunch of noisy, demanding tourists. I would never live in a town like Jackson Hole because of their tour tourism. So again, this is about, about River Falls. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to see if we've got a question here as we go, so I'm hoping, hoping I'll get to the question. I, I think it's really more of a statement, so if you want yeah. to just respond. Uh, uh, no argument. <clears throat> that's, that's what this process is about. Choice. People live, people choose to live and, and spend energy commuting to the Twin Cities for a job or wherever else. It's all about choice. And that's what this process is all about. Those five communities were totally different, personality-wise. One had more of a natural, agricultural, art community. They're, they were not carbon copies. And to pick up on what, what Patrick said is um, part, of the, part of the challenge is, you know, I, I was working up in Traverse City. And the grandson couldn't find a job, and he couldn't afford to live there. Because in a city of 28,000, there were 280 attorneys. And then the folks from Detroit and Chicago who had summer homes there. So those are hard questions. On the other hand, where's the income coming from? So it's, it's a balancing act. I feel very safe saying that. It's a balancing act. And this process and this dialogue, this community dialogue, is going to take us to a balanced solution. Great. Thanks, Ed. Patrick, uh, there was mentioned during the presentation, of, you know, the importance of young people and 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 how how critical that is to the future of our communities. And yet, there's a lot of active uh, older folks, uh, maybe those in retirement, but they're very active, interactive in the community. Speak to that just a, a little bit, and the, the importance of really looking at holistically across uh, and how that how that's worked in communities. Yeah, uh, a couple of things, and and. Um First, back to the back to the prior comment or or, or um, statement. Uh, one thing I, I do want to say is that River Falls is going to be different ten years from now than it is today. No matter what you hope that to be, it will be different. And and a lot of the challenge we're facing in Rochester is that in many ways the DMC initiative has, has pulled the veil off of that and has made it clear that Rochester is going to be different. 
and, and, but it's true of every city and every town. So what, what can't happen is the expectation that things are going to be the same, because they won't be. What can happen is that you can, you can avoid being a victim to that change. Instead, you can be the steward of that change. And this idea of, of young people uh, uh, really building communities that attract young people, I think the older I get, the more I want to hang out with young people, right? So uh, I, I, think, I think that's what people are looking for. If you look at downtowns, downtown Minneapolis or downtown St. Paul or downtown Chicago, there are two demographics in that downtown, in those downtowns. Empty nesters, uh, people at or near retirement, and and millennials, and the the reason empty nesters are down there is because of the millennials in many part because of the energy, the spirit that that brings. So this is not an either or kind of thing. It really is um, uh, it, it is what for for many people as they get older something that invigorates them to be around young people. So it's it's I, I don't think it's either or. I've got a follow-up question to you. Uh, Andy Roth, where's Andy? Andy wants to know if you want to go fly fishing tomorrow, Patrick. Oh, I, I, have to, I would love to. I have to pass on that, but I'll take your uh, name and number, though, and I'll look you up uh, before the end of September. Yeah, you guys connect up afterwards. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Bob, a, a question or two about the charrette. Um, how will people on the first day, so thinking about Thursday again, which is kind of the first full day, how do you see people, the public, in this case, interacting uh, as that's going on. Sure. So um, we're going to have breakfast. We'll open the doors. Uh, it'll be about 8.30. So uh, if you get up before then, you can visit us at the coffee shop. But uh, about that time, uh, we'll be at our desks, and uh, we'll be working. And, uh, but we will, at all times, have a what we will call, uh, for lack of a better word, a greeter, a concierge. So this may be a member of staff, it may be a person on our committee. So when people come to the come into the studio, uh, you won't just wander in and what's, wonder what's going on. I mean, you may, but for the most part, you'll be greeted, um, and uh, we'll we'll ask, you know, welcome you there, and um, we'll be working in teams. So if you've never been into a design studio before, there'll be people on computers with monitors and color things will be happening. There'll be people with big maps and tracing paper and, and colored pencils and markers. We'll have flip charts up and we'll basically be working on and digesting the conversations we've had with all of you the night before. Um, and we'll be starting to organize ourselves in terms of starting to develop scenarios and design concepts based on those conversations. So you can come in and sit down at a table where one of us may be working, and you may just want to you know, watch somebody work for a while to see because you've never done that before. Or you may have a desire that because you own a piece of property that's on the river that's you know, being considered as part of this corridor, come on over and tell us what your plans are, or let's talk about how we might interact together uh, to leverage this planning process and the future of, of your ownership. Uh, so, you know, sky's the limit. There's no bad ideas. On that first day, come in and talk with us, um, and we'll be having conversations. We're going to have lunch, so come and have lunch with us. So it's really about sharing that experience. Um, and if you're, uh, you know, a talented person with a camera or a, or a pencil or a pen, and you want to sit down and draw for a little while, by all means, we would love to get your hands and your ideas on the whole planning and design project. So I think there's a lot of different ways for people to communicate and to, to participate. Great, thanks. We've got time for probably two more. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that we'll answer all the questions. So if you're wondering why you didn't answer mine, uh, but we're going to continue to direct you back to the project website. We will we'll answer all of them. Um, and so you can see that there. I'm going to give this one back to Ed, so we're just going to make you keep passing the microphone. Um, Ed, does dam removal reduce the recreation activities to only being a river community that is accessed by just fly fishermen and kayakers? How does that benefit the general population of the city? Again, the solution is a balance. You know, uh, change is stability, as Patrick was saying, in that quote about the river ever changing. That river is constantly changing and it's flowing through your community. So whether it's they stay, they're removed, we're gonna, we're gonna check that out, we're gonna talk it through. But with that, 
we will identify different opportunities, uh, how to change it, how not to change it, and it's that collective conversation that is really the answer to that question. I'm not trying to avoid it, but that's what the process is about. You need to help. What we'll, we'll help set up the questions, we'll help generate and facilitate the ideas, we'll help you evaluate it, help you understand the pros and the cons of the different solutions. Our job is to facilitate, and part of facilitation is to inform you so that you can, as a community, make an informed decision. Because you have to live here, and you want to stay here, and you want, it's for the, the, the grandchildren, the next generation. That's really what it is about, the sustainability of this community, its future growth, and whether we're on bicycles, cars, whatever, I don't know. But as Patrick said, it's not going to be the same place. But the right change and the right balance is what's going to be the longevity and the legacy. That's an important word, the legacy of this community. And I want to say one more thing. I want you to feel sorry for me, too. I have my fly rod in my back seat, <laughs> and I came three hours late. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I just hope you really embrace this opportunity and help answer that question. Great, thanks. One last one, um, and I'm going to go back to Patrick. This is a very good question, I thought. Zoning is a way to move uh, forward from maybe a negative to a positive, and you gave some great examples, certainly in St. Paul, and, and I know with your experiences now in Rochester, zoning becomes a, uh, sometimes a barrier to how things move forward until you can, can get things in sync. So there's a question here. Uh, how can we assist the local development of the built environment to enhance our community if local zoning works against that? So how, how do you... They kind of sync up the image of that development plan, if you will, um, by making sure that the zoning works hand in hand. I mentioned that, thank you, that is a great question. And I mentioned that I am a senior research fellow with the University of Minnesota College of Design. We had a, a meeting today where we talked about that very question, actually, which is much of zoning is backward looking. Much of today's zoning is for 20th century cities not for 21st century cities, where we zone where people can work, industrial, we zone where commercial properties are, we zone where housing is, and yet 40% of people, at least one day of the week, work out of their homes. Uh, the way people commute is changing dramatically. So the, the zoning methodology uh, made sense, perhaps, in the 20th century. I think we have to rethink that for what, we, what 21st century cities look like. And let me just make a plug for your three-day design charrette. Uh, I would encourage, this is, as I looked at your process, it is very, very impressive. And, and, uh, and you as a community, I, I hope you find ways of taking that weekend off and spending it here. Because the kind of change that you can influence during that very concentrated time um, is, is very, very powerful. And it only works, it works best rather, when people stick with it over that very intensive days, over, over that very intensive time. And, and I'm, I'm just really impressed. At, at the design team will be exhausted um, at the end of that, and you should make sure they are, because you keep bringing ideas in throughout the weekend. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I've got just one quick housekeeping item. Again, I want to advertise the design charrette is at the end of October. There was a question somebody uh, asked, and I, I had the slide for this one. So how is it going to be promoted and advertised? You'll be seeing a lot of different ways that that's going to be communicated uh, to the entire city about what's going on, how you can participate. So be watching for that uh, as we go. Um, I'd like to thank all three of our speakers tonight. So please give them a round of applause. <laughs>